Item yeah. 7, the Christchurch Wastewater Treatment Plant Recovery Update. So, um, we've got staff at the table. So, we need to go back to the top slide. All right, thank you very much. So, let's um, now move into this item. And, start the um, and we'll start with, obviously, a presentation from staff. And then we'll move to questions and then discussion. So I intend to keep this quite structured. So let's receive the presentation from staff first, then any questions, and then we'll move into discussion <coughs> after that time. So um, thank you for joining us. Let's move into the item. Thank you. Uh, kia koutou, uh, councillors. Um, this is the third, I think, of our fortnightly briefings to um, either this committee or the full council. Um, just to reiterate, the, the report that you received um, in the agenda it was a summary of what we reported to the Council two weeks ago, um, with a little bit of information about the social support or the community support package, which we'll expand on today. What the team's going to do is walk you through all the activities... Sorry, just, just one moment. I'm going to stop you. We can't run this meeting with other side conversations going on at the same time. Um, so I just want to resolve whatever's happening here first, and then we'll um, give you our full attention at that time. All right, apologies. Um, maybe if you could rewind by about 30 seconds, right. and our attention is fully upon you. Okay, right. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, so the, um, so the, the written report was a summary of what we reported two weeks ago to the council meeting. Um, what we will do now is present to you the activities that are happening with regard to the fire recovery project um, over the last two weeks and what is coming up. Um, I've got the full team here, not all the team will talk to you today, but we've got the full team here to answer any questions that you have. Um, and so that um, on the screen is the outline of our presentation today. Um, I think probably taking questions at the end, Chair, rather than as we go. I don't know what your preference is. Um, yeah, no, question. I think let's take the full presentation and then questions at the end. Okay, yep. thank you. So I'll now hand over to Helen, who in Adam's absence is just going to talk you through the um, operational side of the plant. So just a quick reminder that the plant is being reconfigured to compensate for the loss of those trickling filters. And the main job here is to convert two of our four clarifiers into aeration basins. Uh, now, the other focus on the plant, of course, is the excavation of the trickling filter material. That's not shown here and be reported separately. And also a, a big focus on the performance of those oxidation ponds. So in terms of work done over the last couple of weeks, so the, we're plugging the trickling filter outlets. That's a permanent plugging of those. And wastewater is being overpumped from those trickling filters. Then move on. Uh, and the big job that's underway at the moment is the trickling fil filter bypass pipeline. So we have a small bypass pipeline, but that's not big enough to, um, to cope with the full flow of the plant. So at the moment we're trenching and installing the main bypass pipeline that will uh, allow us to fully operate those aerators. Excavated material from that trenching work is uh, being stored in the lagoons just to allow us to test that before we dispose of it. We need to know whether or not there are any contaminants and what the levels of those contaminants are before choosing the disposal method for that. Uh, we have completed the installation of the power cables to those converted clarifiers, so the aeration basins and those new aerators are now running off the site power rather than the generators, and the generators are, are being used elsewhere. So it's really pleasing to see those running. Uh, now, so I want to move on to the oxidation ponds. So, uh, as you know, with the trickling filters out of action, the oxidation ponds have been receiving a much higher load of organic material than they usually do. They have performed well over the summer period, but with cooler temperatures and reduced sunshine hours, we're seeing those oxidation ponds deteriorate. So they're not performing as well, and the water quality is continuing to deteriorate. I want to um, to go through some detail of that for you, so we'll come to some some to come come to some graphs um, and some detailed material. But that has led to an increase in odour from the oxidation ponds. So we have two main sources of odour on site: the trickling filters, following rain and warm weather, we get odours from those, and the oxidation ponds, we're inc increasingly getting odours from there. 
And people have also noticed the reduction in bird numbers on the ponds, and that's followed the change in water quality and the fact that the habitat's no longer suitable for midges. So if we can move on. So it's difficult to see this graph, but um, what you're seeing here is the biological oxygen demand. So that's the the organic load going into the ponds, if you like. And the, there's a line up the center of that graph which shows the date of the fire. So you're seeing 12 months data, and you'll see it's a biological process. So the, the biological oxygen demand fluctuates over time. But generally, the oxygen demand on the ponds has doubled since the fire. So you can see that clearly uh, pre-fire on the left-hand side of that graph and post-fire on the right-hand side. There's also a yellow line running across the top, and that's the guideline value in our resource consent. So um, our resource consent has a number of guideline values for a number of parameters, and the consent itself recognises that the process is a biological one, the quality of that water does fluctuate, and we, um, we have a, a number of results that may be above that line before we have some reporting requirements to Environment Canterbury about the quality of the water. So the guideline there is there for what we should be doing most of the time, um, but we don't breach the consent if we have occasional exceedances of these values. So if we move to the next one, uh, this one's suspended solids, and you'll see there's a much bigger increase in suspended solids since the fire. So prior to the fire, very low uh, levels of suspended solids in those ponds and going out the outfall, but post-fire probably uh, five times as much suspended solids in those ponds. And you can see some spikes, and those spikes are generally related to rainfall events when we get uh, excessive loads on the ponds because we have infiltration into our sewerage system and high loads running through the plant. So if we move on to the next one, um, this is ammonia and ammonium, so those are reduced nitrogen species. Um, I'm actually quite pleased to see the ponds are responding quite well and we're not getting high levels of these. So that's, uh, that's a very good sign in terms of the ponds continuing to function. And the next one. Uh, here, fecal coliforms. So here we have, um, again, you see that fluctuation uh, because it's that biological process. And on the left-hand side, performing very well for the six months prior to the fire and in the six months following the levels higher and greater fluctuations um, week by week. So for um, faecal coliforms, we have a couple of limits. We have a, um, a lower limit where we'd like to stay most of the time and an upper limit where if we breach that, we are required to go and sample again within 24 hours. And if there's another breach, then we advise uh, Environment Canterbury and the Medical Officer of Health um, that we've breached those limits. Uh, and we notify what the reason, what we consider the reason for the breach and what we're going to do about it. So um, those ones that you can see there, the February one was indeed due to a storm event uh, and the notification to the Medical Officer of Health and Environment Canterbury went through, although it went through a couple of days late, uh, which we apologise for, and the May one uh, we've also notified. So moving to the next one, enterococci. So uh, enterococci, so this is uh, one of the pathogens that we monitor. Again, you'll see the fluctuations both before and after the fire, but since the fire, we're going above the guideline value more often uh, than we would like. Again, these have been notified through to Environment Canterbury and the Medical Officer of Health uh, in the next one. So. Coastal water quality, so we take weekly samples also of coastal water and we take those in three places along the coast. So our outfall goes out from New Brighton and it goes out three kilometres. So we monitor north of the outfall, roughly in line with it, and south uh, down at Sumner. Uh, we're generally seeing that faecal coliforms and enterococci over the past 12 months have stayed well within the guideline values. Uh, we have seen some high ones at New Brighton Beach and at Sumner, at both of them in February following the storm. And we saw one high enterococci in January, took that second sample within 24 hours and were within the standard for that one. So uh, the coastal water quality has actually held up pretty well right through this. Uh, and that's, that's indicative of the ponds performing well through the summer period. Thanks, Alan. Um, trickling filter. Uh, work uh, site establishment started on 12th of May 
um, Southern Demolition uh, have been undertaken the following work over the last two weeks. So they've got the delivery of machinery on site. So there's been two cranes, two excavators. Um, they've also undertaken uh, some earthworks on site, which is a spreading of uh, uh, gravel and compacting of that gravel. Uh, they've undertaken site clearance of some vegetation that was going to be in the way. Um, and they have commenced the sheet piling for the first ramp. Um, so that sheet piling, just some facts on the sheet piling, each of those sheet poles is 12 metres long, uh, 700 kgs each, and it's uh, 112 uh, sheet poles per ramp. So they're about 40% of the way through the construction of the first ramp at the moment. Um, we are on programme, if anything, we're slightly ahead of programme. Um, while they're not undertaking 12 hour days on site at the moment, those 12 hour days will commence with media removal. However, they are doing seven day weeks at the moment. So um, we are, I guess the key message there is we are on program, in fact, slightly ahead of program. Coming up next week, um, they'll be completing the uh, piling for ramp one, um, and they'll be starting to do the filling it with um, pit run or AP65. AP so um, that'll enable that ramp to be completed and the excavator to move to the top and commence uh, removal of some of that media. We're hoping at this stage, as I said, um, slightly ahead of schedule so we could be looking at removing media second third um, of June so that's before Queen's birthday um, they'll also be looking at constructing uh, the concrete pads for the chippers and compactors and also the loading areas and the delivery of uh, some more plant on site which is a hundred ton excavator as well um, and I guess it pays a note too that while those sheet poles are, are being put in place, there will be some vibration created as they ram down into the ground. Um, uh, we have contacted uh, a local resident who lives probably closest to the plant. Um, just like to acknowledge the fact that we realise those vibrations could uh, trigger memories of events in 2010, 2011. Um, so it's, it's really just uh, don't be alarmed. The vibrations won't go on forever. Um, we should have the second ramp completed by 23rd of June, so there should be no more vibrations after that. So this uh, was some drone footage that was captured uh, yesterday around lunchtime. Um, from there you can see the uh, two trickling filters, and up to the top of the image you can see a green crane, or teal crane, um, and that's the start of the sheet piling. Off to the right hand side, um, once it comes around a little, uh, you can see the trenching work that's undergoing for the trucking filter bypass work uh, with a couple of yellow excavators there. If you look really carefully in that trench, you might see a couple of uh, high-vis vests. That gives you an appreciation of the scale. Um, but they are quite big structures once you can see a person standing next to them. Um, and on the right of the image there now, as it's coming around, you're about to see uh, the sheet piling for the first of the ramps. Um, as I said, it's about 40% 40, 40 complete. Nice view there too of the left of the uh, secondary contact tanks. And coming into picture on the top left hand corner is the uh, converted um, uh, clarifier tanks with the uh, aerators on them. Hi, Nigel Grant, Environmental Health, and thanks for the opportunity to present here, as always. And so air quality testing, we're carrying that out to characterise, characterise the odour. As reported last time I was here, we were just um, continuing on with that monitoring. You can see there now that we've completed uh, four, four sets of tests, and we're planning to continue those for at least one, probably two. Um, of the testing results that we've had to date, which is the, the first three, we're expecting the 25th of May, probably later today, so we can begin reviewing it, but we're not predominantly, but the compounds of interest that we are seeing at times, depending on the weather conditions, are, are both hydrogen sulphide and mercaptans. Uh, hydrogen sulphide, as people have we've probably said or you've read plenty of times, is, is, is well known for its odour, and it can be detected in, by 
people detect it in diff differing levels, but it, it's, it's certainly a driver of, of the odour that will be being experienced. And equally, macat dens is a um, it, it's it's detectable at very low odours, uh, low levels, and it's it's commercially used as a stenching agent. So, and with our monitoring, we continue to review the sites, and in fact, we we adjust them weekly, we expand them weekly, as uh, weather conditions. Uh, indicate and for example yesterday there was a west more of a westerly influence and so we, we samples were carried out in that direction Jeez. so that's yeah, that, sorry it's not a very good quality map um, uh, just just to give an indication of, at the moment of the spread of, of how far this the sampling is going and we'll as I say we continue we continue to um, review it and as I'll talk to in a minute Soon we'll also be taking a, a, a look at with our partners as to just how, how much further to expand that. So, thanks. So, collaboration environment with environment, Canterbury and community and public health. So we we, we have a small group that uh, meet weekly, and of course we circulate the results to them, and um, we and discuss discuss those, and we also discuss the monitoring sites across the plant, and into the community and. Yeah, we're we're letting uh, community and public health know the district health board they're aware of the results as we receive them, as well. Schools and early childhood centres. So Gary might talk about that as well. But we we have meetings with them, uh, the, with the, through the Ministry of Education, this week and next week to talk to schools in the area and also uh, early childhood centres the following week, as well as that uh, we're in communication with the, at least one local school at the moment if we're doing something near there. Um, there's been discussion around black discoloration or, uh, or mould, seems, seems to be mould. So we've, we've uh, located a provider who can both analyse samples of the mould and also, depending on what that shows us, we may put airborne spore traps out as well if, it, if it's shown to be mould, of course. So that, that will be happening, uh, I'll be, that'll get initiated at the end of this week and definitely continue on into next week. And so the next steps is um, we continue, to, well, we'll review the results to date with partners. We said we were going to do four to six weeks. When that's, when that's completed, we'll be, we'll be taking a, 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 an overview look of the whole lot and where we go to move forward, which will involve obviously confirming the ongoing sampling locations and, and uh, you know, define the parameters that we need to continue to test for. There's been questions, so these are all, just to clarify this, the samples that we do at the moment, they are just grab samples. The air is just collected into a bag and, and it goes away and, it, and it's analysed through some very technical equipment. But it is, it is a grab sample right at that moment when the guy opens the valve. Um, so there's been discussion around that as to you know, can we get more re real time or 24 hour monitoring? So yes, we're, we're accessing hydrogen sulfide monitors that we'll be able to locate in the community. And we, we have one of those should be arriving tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's on its way to us in that, that type of time frame, And we're investigating also getting some more as well. So that will certainly narrowing down the, the uh, compounds that we monitor for um, and and continuing that out for a longer period is certainly part of our program. So, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce myself to uh, the people behind me and the people online. Uh, my name is Gary Watson. I'm the Partnerships and Planning Manager at the Council. Um, I'd like to acknowledge firstly before I start the people living close um, within this environment, uh, the people living wider and all of Christchurch who, who are smelling this. Um, we understand that everyone is, is being affected by it. Um, I saw a comment on Tuesday night around uh, this package and how uh, it may be seen as being divisive because it's only a certain group of people. That is not our intention at all. Um, so I hope it's not seen as that. So I will start through the package. Uh, so my overview, um, I'm going to talk about the context, the objective of why we've put this forward. 
uh, the proposed package and then the financials. So uh, proposed responses are based on the following understanding. Um, we've listened to the community feedback when I've been uh, when we've been designing this. Um, residents have been living with a horrible odour as a result of the fire at the wastewater treatment plant. There's no doubt about that. There are 3,380 households in the direct vicinity that we have identified. There are further properties experiencing a level of discomfort, and that goes far and wide. Uh, one of the main sources of stench from the plant will be eliminated by early September 2022 in four months. Um, the, the map, unfortunately, well, hopefully I can describe it, and I think most people know, but if you have a look at the, the orange, the green, and the grey, um, all of that is within the zone, and then as the state highway comes round and through the middle of the ponds. Uh, the area was chosen due to an assessment on the frequency of the odours, intensity of the odours, the duration of um, reporting, and the offensiveness of the smell and the proximity to the plant. Um, so the objective is to alleviate some of the immediate financial impacts for local residents, to improve community access to information, and to work with community partners to increase uh, access to referrals to other supports as we go. Uh, proposed response package, um, financial support for households. Uh, I'll, I'll talk these through. Uh, support package to the schools, referral process to other supports in the community, and some planned workshops to deliver guidance around livability. I wasn't sure if livability was a word, but um, I, I put it in anyway. Um, and that's this, you know, the basics on how do you some of those tips about how you live within this. Um, so I'll start with the household financial support. Um, the households who are resident in the most affected areas, so the 3,380, um, where our contribution, we are not restricting that to anything in particular. Um, we, we have heard many um, things that the community feel need covered. There's some examples up there. Uh, extra power, dehumidifiers, air conditioners, um, purchase of appliances, um, contribute to the cost of specialist services, for example, GPs um, and other professionals. Uh, the vets were one that had come up with me as well. And a contribution for relief um, options around people that just would like to get out of town for a, uh, a weekend or an evening or you know, take their kids to the other side of town. Just it's really not restricted. Um, there are some restrictions, but I'll get to those, but not on that type of stuff. Um, how it will be distributed? Uh, it's, it's stuck. I'll just talk and it'll catch up with me, maybe. Um, it's essential that this is available as quickly as possible. Um, there's no requirements for invoices. All, all we need is a proof of address. Um, it has no impact on current financial support that residents may be eligible for, um, either in the future or, or at present. Um, it's easy to access, uh, flexible and responsive, and has minimal transaction costs, so the money goes to the community and doesn't go to the infrastructure of delivering it. Um, we're really having trouble with these slides, but I'll carry on. Uh, distribute in partnership with the community agencies. So we'll just click one more, Michael, if that's right. No, 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 okay. Uh, so the rationale for that was that um, it gives us four access points for people to go to, to receive the support. Uh, the community groups are in the community and so already have links to other supports. Um, they, they know other providers within their community who can, they can refer to. Um, less cost of administration of setting up um, a totally different structure, a new structure. And there's relationships in place already. And um, places of comfort was one of those things I heard from people. This is our community, um, and we would like to not have to go to other places to re um, receive support. Uh, I'll move on to the school support. So the objective is to provide relief to the schools, students, and staff. Uh, so we have met with the Ministry of Education, oh, sorry, we are meeting with the Ministry of Education 
um, and principals from 23 schools, including early learning centres. And I need to clarify, within that there's seven schools and then um, 16 or 17 early learning centres. Um, and we're meeting with all of the principals within the next seven days and um, we're working on a partnership model on how we can support them. Uh, the objectives of the community information is to ensure that the residents are informed um, and empowered, they know where to get support and what supports are available. Uh, we have practical options to minimise distress. So, um, and that's the workshops I talked about around heat pumps. Um, I, uh, I did mention DVS and then um, the lady behind me spoke about the DVS issue. So um, things like that though, how, how we can do to practically help live through this. Um, and ensure other groups and agencies in the, sorry, know what's available and can refer people to the supports. So we'll get to the financials. So um, the request is for a million dollars from council. Um, the budget is simply split in two splits. Um, household support at $200 per household for the 3,380 residents immediately there. Some allocation around discretionary allocations on medical grounds for people that may not live within the area. Um, but those are quite tight, quite small. Uh, and then the community support and the administration, which is uh, about running the meetings and providing the four communities, uh, community providers, some administration assistance. And then the school support, uh, it is 200,000. Um, uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. Um, and the schools aren't all within the zone. So the schools are, um, a number of the schools, a lot of the schools are outside of that initially indicated zone. So although it's not directly supporting families, and I understand that, um, the tamariki that go to those schools, um, hopefully, um, will we'll be able to gain some support from this. Uh, the funding uh, is coming from the underspend. Um, now we've got the slides going, I haven't caught up. Um, oh, and I might be. Oh no, uh, and where to from now? So uh, hopefully the report and everything is signed off today. Um, if it is, uh, finance released to the partner agencies uh, available for distribution on the 30th, which is Monday. Community information workshop calendar published, and that's those workshops I talked about, by the 8th of um, June, partly because there's a public holiday in the middle and um, there's a lot of conversations to have. Um, ongoing conversations with Community Public Health, Ministry of Social Development and Ministry of Education to look at partnership support options going forward. Uh, we need to evaluate and monitor this support package and see what the impact has been. Um, and there's an information booklet that which will be, um, oh, the comms unit will talk about it, but the information booklet will be delivered to all households within the area and will be available in our, our libraries and our service centres and other areas where people gather. Um, so I will hand over to Katie. <clears throat> Kia ora koutou. So just a bit of a, an update on communications, um, what we've done in the past two weeks and then a look forward. So we've distributed start work notice. We've got that rolling blog established and we're updating that at least two times, sometimes three times a day. And that's everything from wind forecasts and on-site updates um, to an opportunity for us to answer some questions that we're hearing either on social media, from the community meeting or us directly. We're also going to have information up there about the community support package. We've got a weekly in newsletter. Now we're aware that obviously um, electronic doesn't suit everyone, so we're making that e newsletter available in hard copy from uh, locations, the, the community locations. We're updating the website um, regularly, again, two to three times a week with information, and we're updating our Q and A's on a constant basis. So where to from here? Obviously, we've got a lot of communi um, communication out around the community support package. We're going to have a booklet going out to the um, 3,000 plus homes um, in the most affected area. 
Newsline story, social media, it'll be the feature of our e-newsletter. Again, that will be made available in hard copy and will be distributed to community hubs. We've got information internally for staff so that they um, know the details. And we've got the Q&As for providers and the customer service developed. We're going to be continuing that daily rolling blog with information, again, that updates at least twice a day. We've got information panels um, for the community hubs um, and for um, the library at Eastgate Mall. These things are three-sided, stand a bit taller than I, and uh, while they contain static information on two sides, on the third side there's an opportunity for us to put up a weekly poster giving the latest information. We've got media opportunity on site after Queen's birthday weekend. We're responding to questions and updates about the community support and we'll be continuing to develop our Q&As on that. There's web uh, video in development. We've got pump updates uh, when we have the information. And again, that weekly e newsletter, hard copy newsletter, I think I might have repeated myself there, and we're continuing to update the website. Now, I do appreciate we have come um, uh, under some criticism for the communications, but we do um, have quite a bit going up there at the minute. Uh, if there's any other suggestions for things that you'd like to see, please do let me know. Thanks, Katie. Um, just an update on uh, what meetings and reporting uh, is coming up. So we're meeting with the Min Ministry of Education uh, tomorrow and uh, Thursday next week. We have a joint community board uh, meeting scheduled for the 30th of May. Uh, that will be uh, via Zoom and be live streamed to uh, YouTube. Uh, there's the Three Borders Infrastructure and Environmental Committee meeting on the 8th of June. Um, council meeting on 9th of June. Also got the Audit and Risk Committee meeting 15th of June and the Insurance Subcommittee 16th of June we're reporting to. Uh, and there will be a community meeting planned for uh, end of June. Exact data that's known at this stage. And we've also got weekly catch-ups with Environment Canterbury and Canterbury District Health Board. Um, just to finish off, so this is the um, last slide. Um, it's a bit hard to read, sorry, but this is just an indication for you of how we've set up this project. So we've got a number of work streams happening. Um, we have got a number of um, programs um, written up in terms of plans um, for each of the work streams. What we're doing at the moment is bringing all those together. So what we will do is publish a, um, a plan a recovery plan um, for all the work that we are doing. So um, apologies that we haven't published that to date. The team's been pretty much focused on um, getting things um, going on the ground and responding to um, requests for information and so on. Um, but for the next briefing, or for the next presentation to the council, we will have that, um, and we'll probably publish that before um, we get to the next fortnightly meeting. So it's really, the, 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 the reason that we want to put that slide up is really just to give you reassurance that, that we have got a lot of work streams happening. Um, we are coordinating those work streams. We've got um, regular team meetings, um, weekly meetings for the whole team, and then meetings during the week for the subgroups. Um, and uh, Michael's doing a great job at coordinating the programme. His role is programme coordinator, and we brought him in quite early knowing that this is quite a complex project. Um, we have significantly increased the resources supporting Katie and her team around the communications, recognising that um, that was an area that we, we could do better. Um, so we're really pleased to be able to do as much as we currently are doing. But as Katie said, if there are other ideas that elected members have for what we can be doing, um, please let us know. And we are re receiving some suggestions from the community, which we are um, considering and responding to as well. I um, just want to finish just before we open up for questions to just again acknowledge that um, you know, the community is um, having to live with some pretty horrible smells. Um, the team is very committed to getting those smells reduced as quickly as is physically possible. Um, but this is a huge challenge for us and for the community. This was a major fire event. It was a catastrophic failure. Um, within our, our wastewater treatment plant, we've lost 60% of the treatment. Um, and so we, you know, the team is working very, very hard, knowing that actually the community is having to live with some pretty horrendous smells. 
um, now happy to open up for question, Chair, and the team is here to answer any of those Great, questions. Great, thank you. So thanks very much indeed for the report and for you know what's been a very comprehensive update presentation this morning as well. Um, and yeah, also recognising the, the huge challenges um, for the community, for the um, number of staff that are involved um, in this project across a, a range of areas, and we've heard from a number of different people across those areas this morning. So thank you for the report, the presentation, and for the work that you're doing. Now let's move to um, any questions, and I'll start with Jimmy Chen. Jimmy. Okay. Uh, first, a question regarding to the oxidation pumps. Because based on our the, uh, presentation here and also the uh, habitator the don't go mentioned earlier, you know, I just want to know because uh, those pumps will create hydrogen uh, surf sulfide etc. But this the the source of the uh, the smell. So whether the uh, a moment based on now you know the update the uh, the information, whether the council still consider to flush the pumps or not necessary? So the oxidation ponds are one of the sources of smell from the site. In terms of um, the ultimate solution to that, the solution is to get the converted aeration basins fully online. So that needs the, the pipeline to be completed, which should be completed by the end of, this, by the end of next week. Um, and the pumps on site, although we've got some temporary pumps that we can work around until those pumps arrive from overseas, uh, we are. We have opened the two wells that we've got on site fully. So those two wells are putting fresh water into the clarifiers and putting as much fresh water into the ponds as we can. We've also got two borrowed aerators on pond one, and we're sourcing another four borrowed aerators that we will, um, if we can get them, um, upgrade them and put those on pond one. And we're continuing to add hydrogen peroxide, and we've increased the dosing of hydrogen peroxide so that we can add oxygen into those ponds. So there's a number of things underway to, um, to get as much good quality water going into those ponds as possible and flush, flush them out. Okay, thank you. Second question. Regarding to the entering the, the, the waste the, uh, water treatment plant, the, the operation update, because uh, based on your information, particular mentioned the pumps uh, will be delivered from Sweden, uh, from overseas. Uh, and the estimate departure date, 19 of May. Actually, you know, today is the 26th of May. Whether already departure from Sweden or not yet. And also, I'm concerned uh, because in here, particular mention installation, the end of June, now it's COVID and also the supply chain. You know, those factors, whether can be arrived in the quite installed on time, this is my concern. So we do have delays with parts from both Sweden and China, and then there's some assembly work that we have to do once everything arrives in New Zealand. Uh, and because of that, we've put some temporary pumps in place, and they should be online tomorrow. So there's some temporary workarounds out there uh, to, to cope with those delays. Sorry, last question. Yep, no problem. La last question, particular uh, the, regarding the uh, communication with the public, uh, because in East area, my understanding is quite a few, you know, the, the multi-ethnic uh, community and individual residents. I'm not sure all the booklet, or even the, all the news line or online, whether have, you know, the kind of major, you know, except English, if it's another major, the different language, you know, can they, you know, those affected residents fully understand what's updated status because we have the information, we know who are the, those the, uh, the residents in that area. So we are getting some advice on that and what would be the most appropriate languages to translate stuff into and we are looking into that actively at the moment. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So I've now got Pauline, Sarah, Anne and Sam. Pauline. Oh, thank you. I was, it's an ear question. I was going to ask a question about the Ministry of Education have, using ear purifiers. I read somewhere. Does anyone know, and can you explain to me what they are, how they work, and if they'd be applicable in <laughs> <laughs> a domestic situation? We'll come back. We can come back. 
Um, well, we no, come... not technically how they work, but, you know, what they do. We, we need to understand from the Ministry of Education in those particular schools what they've put in place, so we'll come back to you on that. Okay, thank you. When, when will we know? We've got a meeting with the Ministry of Education when next week, so, okay. yeah, we'll get the details on that and come back to you. All right, thank you. Sarah? Thanks so much. Mine's um, sort of on communications, and uh, while we don't want to hold up any new information coming out... How we're communicating with the community um, is clearly one of the, the uppermost things um, for many people. Um, after the really complicated and ongoing Ooh. floods in 2014, we had a small group of residents that met with council, a couple of council staff, um, maybe three or four times um, to talk about how the communications were going and what format and, and those kind of things. And some really useful stuff came out of that. And I'm just wondering if we would be able to actually, instead of elected members pitching in what they think might be useful for residents, actually have a small group of um, residents that meet with um, our communications staff over how that works. And I know that Vicky and Alex and others would be ideally placed to do that. Yeah, um, yeah so we've, we've heard that suggestion. I think it's a really good one. Um, we'd want to work with the community board, um, as you said, to sort of set that up. But yeah, I think that would be really helpful for us because we um, we don't always know how our communications land and where the gaps are. So yeah, yeah, yeah. very good suggestion. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Anne. <clears throat> Kia ora, this is a question for Gary, actually. Um, it's a wee bit to do with the booklet uh, as well. So I'll, I'll ask speak. Gary first. And then just, just as, a, as a resident sort of... Um, starts the process of accessing support, Gary. Can mm -hmm. you just walk us through how that would look, how the process looks, right from the beginning where they think, I need some help, where does that go from there? Okay, so there's several options and because we have options when people come in. So um, I, would, I would suggest that people ring their closest of these four providers to see um, how many people are there already because the last thing you want to do is go and wait for hours. But... Um, if, if it's me walking in, I'm simply walking in and saying, um, this is where I live, this is my address, whether that be a power bill or whether that be something. Um, I, have a, I have a questionnaire, a five question questionnaire that will take about 20 seconds probably to fill out. It's very simple um, with a signature. Um, some of the options available, um, if someone chose to have $200 credit on their power bill, then simply a copy of the power bill would be taken by the provider, um, the application form filled out. That would be, um, I was about to say faxed, not faxed, scanned through to us because um, council pays, um, has a relationship with all of the power companies. So we can pay that direct as we do through Mayor's Welfare. Uh, firewood would be the same if someone said, I can't use my heat pump, but I would um, a load of firewood, then we could do that. Um, and then I'm taking the lead from the community groups who are saying to me that um, their relationship with their local doctors and their local pharmacies and providers within there, they will go and negotiate ways of being able to pay automatically if required. But um, I'm a bit of an old fellow, obviously, and um, Prezi cards have been the thing that have come up, which allows people to pay almost anything. And they could technically pay their rates um, with a Prezi card. Um, yeah, so I think I think the providers are thinking that that will be one of their main sources, which gives people the flexibility. Um, but really, I'm 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 hoping that uh, you know that's a sort of from woe to go, a maybe five minute conversation at the most. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity, if I can, of those people that have um, elderly neighbours or people that it's hard to get, you know, like a um, a power bill was something. And, a, and maybe a quick note from someone saying, look, I'm Mary and I live next door and this is my power bill and I've asked Brian to pick it up for me. I'm sure that's great. Um, uh, um, one of the providers has mobile um, staff out. And so if people um, rang and said, look, I have difficulty with transport or whatever, then um, one of the providers hopefully will, would be able to go to the home and do that as well. So we're really trying to make it as easy as we can. 
Thank you. That's very clear. Um, and now comms, in terms of the booklet that's going out, obviously the four hubs will be identified and I'm hoping that with the panels too and the malls, people will see where to go. Um, in the booklet, what sort of information will there be and how will it be presented? We've just heard about people's, um, you know, perhaps English as a second language, those sorts of things. How, how are you expecting to communicate through through those booklets? So it's a it's an A5 booklet um, and it gives a bit of a current situation update. It um, has some of our frequently asked questions in it. It uh, details the support um, at a very high level and then provides the details of where people can go, who they can ring um, for more information. And it also has all of our contact information on there and also points people towards where they can find out more information on our website by signing up to the newsletters that kind of carry on. All right, thank you. Sam. <laughs> no, just, just a quick one. Uh, in terms of some of the points Don and mm -hmm. the team have made, I guess I'm getting particularly worried that a lot of staff time is going in to answer individual questions, mm -hmm. when actually I think what we're hearing overwhelmingly from the majority of the community is that we need everyone out there doing the job. Mm -hmm. So I don't need an answer now, but what I'd like you guys to go away and think about is how we can, I guess, better communicate it, but also reduce the need for those specific queries. Um, if you use the, the um, pumps, for example, you know, could we have communicated that better earlier down the line to stop? I, I just worry we're clogging up the system um, when, when we don't. And, and just the other one, and it's, it sort of just popped into my mind this morning around the, the funding package. Have we considered what the excess water charging will do that comes on the 1st of July to that community? Because you, you look at the impacts that could have. I just worry that we potentially haven't thought about that yet. So, again, don't need an answer now, but I, I think we're going to need some good advice on whether there are adverse effects uh, on the community and whether we need to revisit that family plan. Thank you. Um, I've got Aaron and then Mike. Aaron. Yes, I've got um, a couple of questions here. The first one's around the hydrogen sulphide. Um, I didn't hear how much is being detected, how many parts per million. Like, on the, what's the worst sample we've seen? <laughs> Nigel, come and answer that one for you. The, the worst samples we've seen working off the um, some California guidelines, I don't have the document in front of me right. at the moment, but close to the pond, just without quoting exact numbers, close to the pond, it's, it's been close to the environmental limit. The, for this California standard that our air quality specialist is working off at the moment. Coming out to, out away towards the community, start of the residential areas, it's it's going at about quarter. That was on one that was on the worst but day. That's using the California measure, but WorkSafe have their own in this country. There's a higher, there's a there's a much higher. Um, the WorkSafe ones are for a working environment that yep. that relies on um, people working eight hours and getting they're, they're out of it for the rest of the time. So the, the so what, what, are you allowed to say what the highest you've seen is? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, it's, on, it's on our website. The, uh, the reason I can't is I don't have it off the top of my head. Just yeah, give me a... Can, can we I've got it. It's, um, it's in the yeah. three to 400, isn't it? So most of, the, um, most of the results are expressed in parts per billion, not parts per million, because they're very low. And the highest ones that we've got are around just under 500 parts per billion, right. or half a part per million, right. okay. adjacent to the ponds. But they um, they decrease quite rapidly with distance from the plant. Yep. Uh, what we want to do, though, because hydrogen sulphide is the is the gas of most concern, is that we want to put the continuous monitors in mm. uh, and work out what levels they are over time and at different distances from the plant, particularly where the prevailing winds are in the northeast. Yep. So that's the work that we'll be able to do as soon as we get those new sensors. Okay. And we'll have a much better idea of those hydrogen sulphide levels. Yeah, so th that's good to, com to communicate as well, is that they're nowhere near the WorkSafe numbers and stuff. I mean, they're miles away. But yes, and we've done, we've done a lot of work around the plant, both to characterise where those odours are coming from and yep. where the gases are coming from, and to make sure that the work environment is safe for our own staff. Yes. Okay, and then the next one is... Um, that you mentioned the airborne spore traps. Why not just deploy them, just and capture? If the, not, wait for the other test to come back to say, yeah, we think we've found mould, because we may or may not. But just put the traps out and capture them. 
probably will do that. First of all, it's, I guess it's about doing the testing of what's there first to see what it to see what it is to see what we should be looking for on the spore traps. It's just about a really a chicken and egg type and process. With the we'll be guided by us the specialist who's going to provide that. And given that we've got um, two stinky items today, the other one's the OPP. Did we use the airborne spore traps around there? No, no. I, I don't. No. Think, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. And then, um, and then, uh, just f a couple on the bits raised by Don earlier around the community requests. So I don't know on the Swedish filters one. Can, can we just get a, a forward-facing thing that just keeps like it's just an update every day on our own website that just says they're currently sitting there. They're now at this airport because people get excited by that stuff. We have that. Yes, it's on the rolling blog. So you can see it now. We will see it, yes. So I think they've put the, the latest on that rolling blog and we're keeping the comms people up to date every day. Right, so that'll be clear from this way forward. And then the other one is that the public had been raising, so a lot of locals are saying the ponds are dead. Uh, and you did refer to that today. Can we make that really, really clear? And the question they're asking is, can they be flushed and brought back to life? So that's the, the same question that we got from yep. Councillor Chen. So the ponds are not performing as well. Uh, now no, that the temperatures have dropped and um, the sunshine hours are less. So they are still performing, but not as well as they were in the summer. Uh, I would not describe the ponds as dead. So can they be flushed? So what we're doing is, so as soon as we've got that bypass pipeline in place, then much better quality wastewater will go into the ponds and we'll essentially flush them. And we've got the two bores, so the wells that we've got on site, we've got those fully open. And that, that's putting fresh water into the clarifier basins, and that fresh water is going into the ponds. So we're doing as much as we can to flush them now. Okay. And once those aeration basins are fully online and treating more of the wastewater, then the, the quality of the water going into those ponds will improve. And then finally, uh, hopefully the only dumb question of the day, can you, because the sun's gone or for, the, for the year till spring, can you use UV artificially? Can you so, add that anywhere? UV won't help because there's oh, no. um, okay. so much water that would have to be a massive um, UV lamp and we'd have to split it into a whole lot of different streams. Uh, and it also has quite high turbidity, so it's really hard to get UV in there. Um, but so what, what we are doing... When, you know. Yeah, what, what we are doing is, is continuing to do the peroxide dosing, yep. so that will help. That adds oxygen because the peroxide breaks down into oxygen and water. Great, thank you. Thank you. So I've got Mike and then Celeste. Thank you. You have a question for Gary. Thanks, Gary. Um, just the, the $200 um, per household, is that a cap, is it? Uh, so um, what I did, what I did in, in, in all honesty, was the amount of money by the amount of people. Um, it's just simple mathematics at the moment. Okay. Because uh, I'm just curious if, if we were to put a... A cap like that on, or a number, why would therefore need people to explain why they need the money and not just if they prove that they're actually a household within the area just actually be granted the money straight away? Oh, that, that's pretty much what it is. Um, the, the evaluation more for me is about just what people are taking it for. Should this go forward? Um, I'd just like to know how much we're spending on each thing. But if someone takes a Prezi card, I'm not, I'm, yeah. There, there isn't too many questions about that. Okay. Okay. I, I, I don't think I've answered your question. Sorry. So if somebody doesn't want to tell us how they want to spend the money, we're not going to force them to tell us. Okay. I guess. So no. it's really just for our own monitoring and reporting purposes that we're sort of interested in what people are saying that they want the, to spend the money on, but we're not holding them to that, and if they don't want to tell us, we will not force them. Okay, no, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. And then I've got Yanni. Hi, Gary. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, I see in the recommendations about supporting um, residents who are most affected by the odour. Just wondering, what's the data that we're using? Is it the Clean Air app? Is it complaints? Is it geographically? Like, is there information that we can see where the spread is? So um, I'm going to pass that side post. And just here. quickly, I'll quick fly up. Because um, I look at the Ministry of Environment Guide for Pre uh, Managing Odour, and it says that even at low levels, you know, it has, can have a chronic impact on people and also the sensitivity of people differs. So what affects one person quite close could also affect someone a bit further away. 
So I'm just wondering what options are there left for those if the money's being allocated to that area and there's nothing outside of that? What will be, what will be available for other people who might report issues and be able to show that there has been some other impacts? So um, um, there is there is some room in there to move, but it, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that because um, at the minute I say that, the room to move can be quite big. You know? So I'm, I, I, yeah, that that is the zone we are looking at. The, the community organisations, my conversations have been, there's some flexibility there, but someone who lives, and I'm sorry for this, but someone who lives four blocks out of that zone, um, it, it would be, I don't think they would meet the criteria. And I'm not asking the groups to make that decision. Um, someone who comes with an exception, unless it's a, um, a relationship that the group knows or they can see clearly that a small amount will help someone, um, I'm asking those exceptions to come here. Um, and within council, um, we may be able to help with the different funding options we have. And Mayor's Welfare is one of those things. All right, look, thank you. I, I, I can't take comments in public gallery, I'm sorry. I know you might be able to answer this, Gary, but was there data? that What was the methodology for determining the impacts? Uh, so determining the impacts or determining the area? Yeah, so um, up, up on the slide, we've got the factors that were taken into account to set that boundary. On the hub or somewhere? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, the, so on the right-hand side, we've got the considerations that were applied. So the frequency of the odours, the intensity of the odours, and we've got that information from the testing that we've done. Um, the duration reported of the odours, so we are relying on to some extent on um, complaints and the um, Smell It apps, one of the um, one of the data sources that we're using for that. So is ear testing happening, say, in areas outside of what I can see up there? So say in South Brighton and other areas? Yes, there is ear testing um, undertaken in other places, but uh, what we've done is we have looked at the Smelt It app and we have looked at the prevailing wind directions. And I mean, you heard this morning, the prevailing wind direction out there is around 70, 75% that nor'east. Um, so it affects that community down to the southwest of the, of, the, um, of the plant and the oxidation pond. So that was the primary consideration. However, once we have those hydrogen sulfide monitors, we will be able to deploy those both within that area and beyond it to confirm or otherwise that that, that is indeed the, the right area to target. Look at the Clean Air app, and it shows that there are a cluster of complaints in South Brighton, in particular. There are definitely yeah. complaints in South Brighton when the wind is from the southwest, because that's where the odour goes. Yes. So the but the the issue for people in this area is that they get it much more frequently. All right. Thank you. Um, who have I got? Celeste. Yep. And then Yanni. Yanni. Thank you. Um, Several, several questions. I mean, obvious hub, we've just got the presentation, you know, half an hour ago. Um, so just to, just to kind of um, just check in on the Smell It app, does that have any geofencing around where complaints can come from? Kind of. So when people uh, log a uh, complaint through Smelt It, uh, it does look at their rough GPS location and it, it sets a perimeter of about 150 metres around that. So we can kind of see where the clusters are happening. Uh, and from that, we can also see the, the amount of people that are, are lodging those complaints within that sort of 150 metre radius of the GPS location. Right. So but fundamentally, if anyone in the city logs a complaint with Smelt It, it can it will track in the data that we've used to ascertain where people where the complaints are coming from and the frequency of complaints is not just limited to a geofenced area it's across the entire city and that's the data that you've used to come up with the boundary yes okay um 
Just wanted to check um, the questions that came up at the community meeting. I understand staff, you know, weren't at the meeting, but they were listening and, and have watched it. Is, is, any, is anyone in a position to go through the, the questions that have been raised? Um, not right at the moment. Um, a number of the questions we have dropped into the presentation today, right. um, but no, we're not in a position. But we, we are aware of the questions that have been raised and we are working on those. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, to clarify that, yeah. we have gone through, we have listened, okay. we are answering those questions and they are forming part of the Q&As that are going up at the moment. Right. And is, has there been any, um, just picking up on the point that was made previously, around local residents or, or, or local community leaders being involved in the communications, um, who's seen the booklet that's going out and is there an opportunity to um, work that through with the local community to make sure that it's kind of meeting the needs? Um, so obviously um, time is of the essence on this one and uh, we really do want to get it um, out and distributed. It isn't to print yet. Um, we could have a window of opportunity to um, to open up for um, more people to, to provide feedback, but that would have to be offset with um, the, getting the information out to residents and balancing that. So if you have uh, anyone in mind that you think you would like to have a look at it, but in terms of setting up a wider group, that could delay um, this, this booklet getting out by, by a number of days. And I, I'd really like to prioritise getting it into people's letterboxes if at all possible. For subsequent communications, absolutely, and particularly if we set up a kind of a communications group yep. as part of this. But I think um, we need to consider the importance of, of this landing and very quickly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you know, I, I have put a number of requests in the past to actually just have some visibility of the files before they go out, not to delay it, but just to try and add any concern that people have raised with me. And I know there'd be other people in the community that would want to give feedback. Um, just wanted to check in regards to, um, uh, I put through a request that we contact NIWA and we work with NIWA on community air monitoring. Uh, I've, I've sent through the program that they had in Ringi Aura from 2015 to 2017, where they have a community observation network um, for air quality, um, smoke and uh, dust and, and air pollution. Um, and I just wondered, given that NIWA has been one of the groups that have you know, commented in the media, um, what discussions have you had with NIWA? What support can they provide to getting um, monitoring? And could be, and, and one of the concerns that people have raised with me, and I, I hope that it's been raised with staff, um, and I mean I've, I've raised it with staff, but maybe others in the community have as well, is people want to know what's actually happening inside their home, not just what's happening outside, right? Because people are staying in their homes, they're putting up with it in their homes, and they want to have some understanding of what the impact is. Yeah, so we haven't had communication with NIWA up to date. We note that the... the uh, program that they ran in the in uh, 18 2018 was around particular particular monitoring which is quite quite different to what we're looking using at the moment for detecting um, you know tiny amounts of chemical but we are yes we're definitely going to communicate them with them we'll be using our um, our air, air quality specialists to engage with them in the first instance and to, to see whether they can give us any further support around going to hydrogen, assisting with their hydrogen sulfide monitoring. And I think the external monitoring in the, that once we get more data on that and we get more information, that, that will lead us and we communicate with the public health unit, that, that will then probably lead us to whether we do some more work or whether other agencies want to do more work around what's actually in the houses. There's no work, no work being done on that today. We're obviously aware of the situation, though. They've got these outdoor quality air sensors called Odins as well, um, and I think they didn't they put a weather station up in Bexley. We we gave them consent, I believe, to do it. What? Yeah. So we haven't contacted them yet. We can contact them. I mean, I've put the request in several times now, um, so we we can do that and see what. We'll definitely do that. I, I have that question now, so I'll yeah, I'll be working with our specialist, and that will be happening. We'll, we'll certainly be able to report back on that, and then at our next briefing. Okay. Um, you've talked about a community meeting happening, um, and there's some workshops as well. So, just again, I, I guess if we can, we've got the presentation to the community boards. 
and maybe we can just have some thought around get some bit more clarity around dates, locations, venues. Is that able to be done? Yeah, we, we, we can look at doing that. Um, time frame yeah. might be a bit short. The commu joint community board meeting is on Monday. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, we can do our best to supply what dates we can before then. And, we, and we've got a process now to regularly engage the community boards going, going forward. It, it, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So we will look at engaging with the community boards around a, um, a community group to help us with our feedback on our cons. Um, I, you know, we we will. I guess we'll start doing regular reporting to all of the community board meetings. The community boards ask for a joint um, meeting or a joint briefing, which is why we've um, sort of set up the meeting on the thirtieth. Um, we can start doing regular briefings directly to the community boards as well, if right. that's what the community boards want us to do. So I've just, I mean, I've looked at like the flooding task force um, that we set up and kind of read, read through the whole community engagement, the social support. It, it's quite detailed and it's quite myth methodic. And again, just appreciate you've given us a, a chart, um, you know, of quite... Um, you know, high level kind of just one word sort of things. But but in terms of when in, in two weeks when you come back, will the community be able to see what role the medical officer of health is playing, what role MSD or the Ministry of Education are playing, possibly what role NEWA are playing, maybe what role ECAN are doing. And the other thing is we don't seem like when we get our updates, we're not hearing from those people. And I don't I don't know if the community's hearing from the from the medical officer of health or from ECAN, but there just seems to be this kind of lack of um, visibility about what they're doing. Um, and given what we've done in the past, where we've had more joint, joint up approaches around different things. Um, and I sort of, yeah, probably a bit concerned to raise the air quality for Bromley, because that, but that was a joint project to start with. And it, you know, the start of it did actually, finally, after many years, start to show a way of getting action in a local community. So how, how did residents get or, or even elected members get visibility of what the discussions are with ECAN and the CDHB? Um, so we um, we will share with you the notes from the meetings that we've had once they've all been written up. Um, we will talk to our partners, particularly ECAN and Community Public Health, about whether they what they how they would like to talk directly to you, if, if that's um, an option. Uh, and if you want us to put that invitation out to them, we can't force them around the table, but we can um, invite them to come and talk directly with you if that would be helpful for you. Um, you know, they are, prob I mean, we're, we're still, as, we, as um, Helen talked about, we're still um, developing that relationship around um, the response to these issues. Um, and to date, they haven't been in a position where um, they have been able to put out definitive statements publicly but we are working with them on that. So, you know, the community public health is the health authority, um, and so we will be relying on their information, and we'll talk to them about how they might want to communicate in the future. Right. So do you, do you think there's a need for us to go to the Ministry of Health and just stress the importance of, of this issue? And I just, I guess, because I... I mean, given it's a disaster and it's it's you know it's got a massive ramification around people's health and well-being. Mm. Um, I'm just I'm just amazed that there's been such silence around central government and um, those other agencies that should be working together. Particularly when we've seen in past disasters that those agencies have come in, provided support, um, you know, been visible. So, uh, what's the best way for us to work with central government? Um, can we come back to you on that? Um, we'll take the comments back to um, our partners, but and we'll come back to you about how right. we might do that differently. Okay. Um, sorry, I just got a few few questions on the the, the dust monitoring. Um, so, is is the company that we're using the same one that we've used with the organics plant? Who's doing the air monitoring for us? We're using Jacobs, right. which is a multinational company for doing this work for the air monitoring. And are they testing for formaldehyde? No. Um, and do you know what levels they can t can detect H2S? Oh, sorry, um, I'm confusing you. Sorry, it's uh, you were using another another company that's actually doing the analysis. Right. A, a, a laboratory is doing the analysis, but we're working with with Jacobs on the on interpreting those results and um, working with us on the best sites 
so that the actual mon the analysis is being done by a laboratory in the North Island. Okay. And but do you know so not yeah they're definitely not doing uh, formaldehyde and they the um, what they as Helen spoke about before the results that they're um, giving us are in parts per billion which are very low numbers so they're able to detect down to very low levels. Okay. All right, Yanni, I'm keen to pick this up. There are a number of other people who have got questions sure. as well. Yeah. You, can you come back to me? I, I've got three more questions, but let's go if you want to. All right, well, let's deal with the three quickly now. And so then I'll just, come to the I others. can confirm the hydrogen sulfide. So the, um, the detection limit for hydrogen sulfide with the grab sampling that we're doing is eight parts per billion. So that's 0 0.008 parts per million. Um, although there's. Um, there's some uncertainty with that because it is just a grab sample, so we don't know what's prevailing over the full day. When we put the continuous monitoring meters in, they will detect three parts per billion. So they are more sensitive, and they will give us um, the, the change over time as well. Right, okay. Yeah. Just, um, just a question around um, the, the ramps. I mean, the, the sheet piling looks massive undertaking. I'm still... I'm still struggling to understand in terms of methodology why they need to build these massive ramps rather than just take from, you know, just from ground level and, and why they couldn't have done that. But also, I guess, concerned um, or just interested to know in terms of the capacity issues and the constraints around why it will take four months, whether, you know, what other companies have expertise in that matter and, and who's approached us and whether we've talked to um, other companies like... Um, that, that are expert in that field to see if they've got resources that they could provide, recognising there's been a main contractor? So we covered all this um, in our presentation last time. Yep. Um, but just to answer the question about why put the sheet piling and the ramps in, that's so that they can get their equipment to the top of the fil uh, the tripping filters to remove the material. Otherwise... Sorry, we'll... I understand that. But when you look at the disruption and the impact of sheet piling, these big metal things down the side, and then you kind of think... You know that, like, what? That's a huge, massive job compared to what you know. And we were told because there's stuff underneath and blah blah blah. But it just seemed, yeah. I mean, okay, you've made that decision, right? We, we're not going to change it, except that. But just in terms of capacity to get the job done quicker, have you talked to other companies who have similar expertise in this field around what resources could be offered to get it done sooner? Southern Demolition has done everything they can do and are continuing to look at their methodology to make sure that they do this as quickly as possible. They're very aware that the speed is of the essence. They've got a number of subcontractors working for them. Um, as you would have seen in the um, drone footage, it's a confined space. There is not a lot of space around there. And so they, in their methodology, they are also thinking about their own workers' safety um, and our workers' safety because it is still an operational wastewater treatment plant. If there was anything that this, the contractors or us could do to speed it up, we would be doing it. Yeah. And just, um, do you know how noisy it's going to be at night when they start removing the material? Oh, I can find that out. <coughs> Sorry. No, I can find that out for you because they, they will be having chippers running. running. Um, so what kind of noise that generates, um, yeah, I can... I mean, I think okay. um, it was really good to get the first start work notice, and that's obviously for the whole project, but... You know, individual start work notices going out around different things, different stages would be really important. I'm um, just will, the final. Oh, sorry, just on that though, we will be keeping the, the lo that local community in, in, informed on the noise issues. So yeah. we will be, yeah, that will be focused on on our communications once they start operating. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Just the final question from me, just in terms of what people, um, so people that are experiencing property damage or are concerned about the what they're seeing in terms of the. Um, exteriors um, to their cars or, or their houses or even interiors, what, what's the best way for people to record those concerns? And, and to, you know, what's the best way of dealing with that? Should they be contacting council and letting us know? Um, should they be contacting their insurance company? What's the, you know, has there been any thought given to how that's, um, the, 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 the concern is captured, um, and I mean that's related as well to the idea which I actually really support, setting up a health register. Well, th I think the first step is through their insurers. 
So the resident would contact their own insurance company in the first instance? No, so um, so there's, so I guess there's different elements here. So um, if people think that they have genuinely suffered damage, um, then we would suggest that they, and it's significant, they should go and talk to their insurers. But we are investigating the, um, the, the uh, complaints that we've had around <coughs> black material, whether it's mould or whatever, we are investigating that. So, yeah, so um, I, I would encourage members of the community, if they think that there is some damage um, to their properties that we have caused, uh, that is the, the likes of the black growths, to let us know, so we already know about that anyway, if there's other matters. But if it's significant damage to their property and they've got enough concern about it, then the, um, the recommendation is that they go and talk to their insurers if they think that they want to make a claim related so to that, that damage. will that information and easy processes for people be in the booklet that's going out around that? Not, no, no. All right, Yanni, thank you. Um, so now I've got Phil, Sarah and Anne. Phil. Hi, uh, Helen, please. Sorry. <laughs> and there is Was a question. Was that Because yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, is a que there is a question in here. Hey, um, it, it's an unfortunate situation we find ourselves in there, and, and, and to try and help the situation, is the water from the wells that you're putting into the clarifiers to put, try and put oxygen with the water, or just thin it, so to Both. speak? Okay, so and so in theory, I know, I know a surge plant runs, it, it doesn't like infiltration, but when it does rain, we do get it, whether we like it or not. So when it rains, is in theory it help? Uh, no, because it puts a whole lot more strain on the plant in terms of how much wastewater we have to move. So no, rain does not help. So if we get if we get a significant amount of rain, we have to bypass parts of the treatment plant and put, put the wastewater directly into the pond. So it'll still go through the primary sedimentation and the secondary contact tanks, but it'll go through much more quickly, clearly. Right. So, so, so no, rain doesn't help us. Okay, so the suggestion I was going to make is everyone goes home and flushes the toilet three times. That will not help at all. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. So Sarah and then Anne. Sarah. Thanks so much. Hey, I'm... Um, just going back to the communication of the community thing, I just really don't want us to have to go through a formal community board process with member selections and going through on PX reports, all of that kind of long process. When the flood stuff happened, it was um, some members of the community who had been in communication with the council already um, and in consultation with, I think, the community board chairs. And I won't, don't want to slow down the process by making it something formal that needs reports oh. writing and those kind of things. Yep. So just get some reassurance around that. Absolutely, yep. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. And um, Anne. Yeah, uh, a question for Gary uh, around the support package. So um, you've done an amazing amount of work to kind of present something and, and build something, really, that, that you hope we hope will meet the needs of the people who are most affected. How will we know that it's actually doing what we want it to do? What kind of evaluation will we have? How do we get feedback from the community about, yes, this is useful, this is not? And I know that you're really agile. You've, you, you understand getting new information and you can change things. How's that going to work? Well, I guess, in all honesty, part of my introduction this morning was I, I, this will be a long-term relationship for me, I would imagine. So some of that um, um, feedback will be hopefully myself, immersing myself somewhere within the community and being seen a bit more often and getting some feedback. I mean, I, I, I need to know if this works. Yeah. Um, and if it's not reaching and it's not making a difference, then I'm sure we will hear. Um, but, yeah. So, so what, would the, what would that look like? What would channels would people use? Would they just put through the blog or the question and answers or would they, get, would they give their feedback to the hubs that they're dealing with or what sort of thing? How would that look? Oh look! If I'm honest, I haven't I haven't really got there at the moment. Um, but th thank you. You've now given me another sleepless night, which I will. <laughs> I will. Uh, no, 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 no. It's fine. Um, no, it's a. It's actually a very good point, and um, yeah, I'll I'll do some thinking on that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I've got Celeste and Aaron, and then we're probably going to need to bring questions to an end at that point. Um, and Leanne, so I'll come to Leanne as well. So Celeste, Aaron, Leanne, Celeste. Thank you. 
Gary, I have just a very quick one. In that area, will it include, it came up the other night, will it include businesses? So for instance, eateries in that geographic area, so we've got households, will it include sole traders, say, and businesses? Simple answer, no. So for instance, if I was operating a little sole trader eatery and I, I was being impacted by lack of foot traffic, that's not covered. Unfortunately, if you're running a business, no. Aaron and then Leanne. Aaron. Um, yeah, uh, and I don't know if maybe there is something around what Celeste is requesting going forward to be looked into uh, for our next update would probably be helpful. But um, my question is probably Helen again, because um, Helen's the solver of problems. At the meeting um, a couple of weeks ago at the Bromley Community Centre, um, the overwhelming thing that they were saying is they just want the smell to stop. They don't really care about the timelines of fixing and doing and moving and, and pumps and stuff. They just want the smell to stop. And uh, one of the uh, um, solutions that seems to keep coming up is the one of disinfecting those uh, um, trickle filters and, uh, and then stopping the smell, so essentially killing it. Do we have um, a, a document or did someone do the work that... that dispels that, that says that that can't be done, that we can put out into the public so they can see why that does not work. Because I spoke to two scientists who um, are very qualified and work, one works for the government and stuff and they believe it could be, but we need something to, that I can show them and say, no, you actually, you're, you're wrong. Your, your triple degree means nothing. There was an options assessment done and yes, we can, um, we can provide you with a copy of that. So you're saying options? Yes, so they looked at the options, and they looked at the options of adding chemicals to the trickling filters yep. to um, extinguish the source of the smell, if you like, uh, and there were no viable options. The best one was to excavate the material and get rid of it, and that's what we're going with. But um, one of the things you need to remember is at the moment, the, um, we're also getting a lot of odour from our oxidation ponds, so the trickling filters, the work is underway, that's um, largely on track, and now the key focus of the the the, the team at the plant is improving the operations of the plant, getting that interim operation and the aerators, the aeration basins online and improving the quality of the water going into those ponds. Okay, and, and this is one you might not want to answer, but is what would be everything going swimmingly well, what would be the soonest date they're not going to smell anything? Uh, I cannot answer that. If it goes and really I certainly, well. I certainly can't um, promise that nobody will smell anything ever. So we have, um, we have a plant that will be uh, operated as well as we can under the interim recovery plan until the permanent solution goes in place in some years' time. So that plant, while it will operate adequately most of the time, there will be occasions probably due to equipment failure and maybe due to storm events when we will have some interruptions to um, that ordinary operation. Thank you. Thank you. Leah. Just a couple of questions. Um, are you working with other agencies who can help? I remember Yanni raising the question of the Student Volunteer Army and um, Anne Galloway took that and went and had a chat to them. And as a result, the stench-free same-day laundry service was launched um, where they're literally picking up laundry through their volunteer network and um, delivering it back to them. They've entered into an arrangement with one of the, the big uh, corporate uh, laundry companies that has a um, that has given them a good discount. You know, and I know that um, I know that, that um, Gary, you've talked to um, some commercial providers about discounting yep. so that we could get bulk. Um, bulk work done in the dry cleaning area, for example. But you know, are we are we connecting the dots around all of these things um, and making sure that people know that all of these services are available through through these new um, community providers? Yep. So the student volunteer army do what they do, and they started off and went, and it was great. Um, the only thing they wanted from me was because we fund them, um, can we put your logo on it? So they were away. There was no, I, I couldn't have said no. Um, um, I'm saying that you should say no. No, 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 no. I'm just saying, <laughs> yes. will people know all about that option yep. when they go and visit the hubs? Absolutely. Yep. And, and Councillor McDonald has given me a, um, a lead with Maxwell's, and I've spoken to them. Um, 
somebody, and I can't remember which councillor it was, talked about um, Orange Skies, which is a new portable um, laundry system, and uh, we're, I think it might have been Yanni, I can't remember, but we, um, we're following that up as well. And people are starting to come forward. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, today's meeting was, uh, again, a bit of a watershed moment where I can then go and, and build that. Um, but certainly when people come to the hub, there will be as much support information as we can have for them. Because I'm thinking that this is not something that the, actually the, the council needs to um, you know, finance um, in, no. a, in a direct way. We can partner with other agencies and organisations um, throughout the, the, the networks that we have within the city and also the networks that our partners have. So I, just, I mentioned um, the Ministry of Education said that they'd already had a good deal on ventilation units because they'd yep. got them in for COVID. So actually it wasn't hard for them to upgrade to, you know, from a relatively small number um, in a classroom setting or in a school yes. um, from a couple, you know, like to 10 in Bromley School. Um, so that's the sort of, you know, collaboration and partnerships that we want to be encouraging. And, and we need something that kind of sits over the top of it to make sure that that's... Sure. And that's the recovery strategy that that, um, that that Yani's been raising as well. And I think that needs to be linked in. I mean, we've talked about the recovery strategy when we're talking about losing the two trickling filters out of our wastewater treatment plant. Sure. But we need a recovery strategy that focuses 100% on our community. So, yep. And um, the... Uh, um, the start work notices um, deli were delivered after the work had started. So I'm just saying that, you know, good good intentions. I'm still here. Um, I don't know, you weren't responsible for no, no, the <laughs> start work notices. <laughs> um, but, you know, that you know that, that a friend of mine had theirs delivered in their letterbox on the 24th of May. I'd been round there on the weekend um, and the next door neighbour had come in because of all the noise that was happening on Sunday. So um, even the stop work notice said that work would be Monday to Saturday, but actually they were in piling on Sunday till three o'clock in the afternoon. Good on one sense, but on the other sense, when you're at home um, and you get the same shaking right. feeling that the earthquakes created, um, there are multiple layers of stress that need to be taken into account. Um, the specialised pumps, you said um, in the report that they were scheduled to arrive in April, but you knew that they hadn't arrived in April. So how come you didn't report that the last time that you came to this meeting, that they were delayed? Hello, I can't answer that. Um, can I come back and, and let you know? Yep, OK. Um, and um, on the blog it says that they're scheduled to leave um, yesterday, but they haven't left yet, have they? So... We're still trying to find out from the supplier uh, when they're leaving, whether whether they're on the plane or not. So the latest update I had this morning is we we still don't have an update from our supplier. Yeah. So I mean, it's just that I mean, the the the, the current story says that they're leaving Sweden, but I think you said in your presentation that they're leaving China. Yeah. So there's a, yeah. So there is some componentry coming from China as well. Yeah. Right. So, and what did you say about what's happening in the meantime? Because I really was left with the impression, and, and I accept that this is probably my misunderstanding, but others at the meeting misunderstood it as well, that the focus on the trickling filters would actually alleviate um, the, the, the really gross stench that um, pervades the atmosphere. But the oxidation ponds, I, I don't think that we had a very clear understanding of where that was up to, um, uh, certainly not at the public meeting that I attended. So there are there are two main sources of odour at the plant at the moment, mm. the trickling filters and the oxidation ponds, and it depends on the weather conditions which one is dominating. Um, from I was out there on Sunday and the oxidation ponds were certainly dominating on Sunday. Yeah, I'm more interested in knowing what's going to happen when the media is removed from the trickling filters. So I'm talking about the second week in September. What does that look like? What does that smell like for us? Yeah, and we won't know until we get in there. So until they um, start taking off the top layer no, of no, material. No, no, I'm not talking about the trickling filters. Imagine the media is all gone. 
What does the smell look like at the plant? Oh, in so September? That's on the pond. By September, those ponds should be back working properly Thank by you. September. That, that's what I wanted to know. Yes. Because that's what I understood the case to be. Yes. And then I've had uh, doubts thrown into that mix. So. Oh. Because of the delays, yes. Because so the with delays. the delays in the pumping, but we've got some temporary pumps in place. Right. So hopefully we'll turn those on tomorrow. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we're done with questions. Okay. Mike. Because I thought Aaron actually asked a question before about actually the timeline and you, um, when the smell would be gone. Obviously there's exceptions, but you said you couldn't answer it. But it's very clear for looking at the timelines and what's happening. <laughs> that the, the smell should be gone by early September once the uh, media's the gone. The really else. large smell. That continu continuous, pervasive, horrible smell certainly will be gone by then. And yes. that's from both sources. Yes. Yep. Well, Andrew, sorry, I, I, I meant, sorry, I had another one. This is all about the, the, the levels of concerns that we're hearing from the community. So um, environmental health is one of them, so that's about the the quality of the um, wildlife reserve ponds um, and uh, what's being discharged into the into the environment. But the other one's this personal health concerns, and I know that you've 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 said it before, but I think this is a high priority. It's very easy to look up at someone's house and see where they've scrubbed it, um, so that you've got a clean bit and one bit that isn't and you look at it and they say to you, if that's what it's doing to my house, what is it doing to my lungs? What is it doing to my health? And that's the question that we need to 100% know the answer to. And that requires a very in-depth collaboration and understanding with our health um, professionals uh, so that we can front, not as a council, but as a council who's taken advice um, so that we can support our community. People want to know that they're going to be okay. Um, at the end of the day, the primary, the primary focus has been on the odour. But when you go out and talk to people and hear people and what they're saying, they've got some underlying concerns about the long-term impacts that this will have on their health. All right, so um, moving now from questions to... Just, sorry, just, just, just one quick follow-up. I just wasn't quite clear. So um, the business support for local businesses, have we approached Christchurch and Z given that that's kind of their core function and they did it with Chamber of Commerce previously with other disasters that we've had? Like what's, what's the, in terms of the support package, what's the consideration around impact on local business? Um, we'll come back to you on that. So we've heard the request. Okay. We will talk to Christchurch and Z and others. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you, you don't need a formal resolution no, to do don't. that? No. You'll, you'll do it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Phil. Uh, yeah, Helen, where are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so is it fair to say that the, 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 the missing link down there is oxygen? That's what you need the most of? Fresh, fresh. Yes, largely correct. So um, we, need to, we need to remove the organic load from those oxidation ponds. Um, and to do that, we need the aeration basins working. Yeah, so the, the, aer the, the aeration ones are introducing oxygen in as well as stirring up. H have we given any thought, and um, I know there's a firm in town that, because I'm a bit of a hydrogen nut, they've got a machine that makes hydrogen, but one of the byproducts of the hydrogen machine that they have, which makes half a tonne, of um, hydrogen a day is three and a half tonnes of medical grade oxygen a day. If we set one of those up, which could run off our power on site, and then we've, you've got three and a half tonnes of uh, oxygen uh, a day to be able to waste into your system somewhere, would that help going forward? I'm just... Possibly. That's not going to happen tomorrow, I know, but... Yeah, we, and, just... that's, and that's the issue. So... Um, it, possibly, but we'd have to look at the timelines. But we are we are in the meantime dosing peroxide in, so yep. we have the facility to dose peroxide, and we've increased that peroxide dose. Mm -hmm. So that's from um, out of the clarifiers and into the oxidation pond. So we are be able to add oxygen there. 
Mm. But I think that the um, the timeline for getting those aeration basins fully online would probably be faster yeah, than I, an alternative. I, I'm, I, yeah, alternative. I'm just thinking down the track because we're going to have to have a rethink on how we do things because it might be that if we can throw enough um, technology at things, we might not even need a trickling filter one day. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not. We still have to remove the solids. Yes, so we still yeah. got a whole lot of um, mm. organic load and solids removal that we yeah. need to achieve through through some sort of secondary treatment technology. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't want to go back to using the oxidation ponds as oxidation ponds. Mm -hmm. So the oxidation ponds for um, for the last 20, 30 years have actually received very good quality water um, and have just really acted as maturation ponds. And we get some UV disinfection as they pass through the six ponds before they go to the outfall. Mm -hmm. um, but now they're working as working oxidation ponds, which is not ideal for people who live close by. Okay, thank you. All right, Aaron, and then we must do Just a on. really quick one, Helen, on the ponds. Do we harvest blood wounds from the plant ponds? Sorry, do we harvest? Do we harvest blood wounds from the ponds? No, we what don't. Do we use them? You know, they're the fish food. But no, we don't. So, oh, okay. Did we used to? Not that I'm aware of, but okay. I, it's possible. I could ask someone who's been around yeah. here for I'm a long sure time. That, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so, Celeste, you've been working with staff on some resolutions, um, which are what we've got in front of us. I'm assuming in as much as you've been working on that, you're going to be happy to, to move that wording. Yeah. Um, the only point that's been made is that there seems to be some duplication um, between 2A and 4. So because this has been a bit of a work in progress, 4 was added in to pick up some comments that were made earlier, and your 2A um, seems to duplicate some of what's already captured in 4. So whether we can maybe amalgamate the 2? All right, let's have a look at it. Um, all right, so they're intended to mean two different things. Yep, all right. So, I mean, both can stay. And if there's crossover between the two, as long as we get back what we're asking for, then we'll review the implications of the support package. I mean, is it not just review the support package and report back on any, on recommendations on any future, and, and make recommendations on any future measures? Maybe we just say review the review the support package yeah. and report back on any recommended future measures. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, um, it, I, I wasn't suggesting we got rid of 2A. It was more whether we could amalgamate 4 into it. But it, it, it's there with both. It's fine. It's fine. All right, so Celeste, you're happy to... Move that as it stands. Okay, so somebody to second that. Sarah will second. So moved by Celeste, seconded by Sarah. Um, so we've got this resolution in front of us. Now let's move into any debate on this, any discussion. Resolutions as well, amendments. So amendments to this. All right. Or additional resolutions. You can take out four. Sorry, I thought they were all being done together, but obviously they've been separated. Um, right, okay. So we can take out what were you about to say? So four can go. Um, and Helen White's pr provided some um, staff revisions to just... All right, so my first question would be whether the mover and the seconder were comfortable to incorporate these into the resolution. You might want to take a minute just to read them. I'm going to just take five minutes to get these all tidied up. Yeah, I 
The, the boards haven't been briefed yet. They're getting briefed okay. next week for the first time. I was trying to All right, get them look, more involved. Yanni, in the what you do, let's, let's run a process here. Yanni, what you need to do is to come up with wording that you're comfortable with, and then we need to check whether Celeste and Sarah are happy with that or whether they're proposing any changes to it in order to incorporate it into the resolution. Otherwise, we would need to... Um, Staff of Otherwise, we would need to deal with them as amendments. Okay, thanks. So, when you're comfortable, Yanni, with the wording here, just sorry, Helen's got Helen's got some revised wording based on staff advice to my amendments, which are not the ones that are in front of us. They've been, uh, sorry, I just can't say. I, um, I think they've been amended now. Are these the amended ones that you've put through to me, Helen? Yep. Yes, there are, and my apologies, because we did have a few sort of cross-emails yeah. while yeah, there I was under debate. Going so my first so question to Yanni, the then, is are you comfortable with what's here as the amendments that you want to put with staff advice? Yeah, there was another one that Celeste had, which was around council requesting e for collecting data on harm to health, pets, and property, and make this information publicly available. Is that... Yes. Well, we've so, got the resolution moved and seconded already. That's the in the blue. So what you're doing is working out what amendments you want to make to that. And then Sarah. once you've done that, I'm going to turn to Celeste and Sarah to see whether we can incorporate them. Sorry, so that, the, your job is to make sure that you're comfortable with what you're putting forward. Can we just investigate that last register? Because I'm happy with one in three. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and two will delay things, but yeah. you can... Well, no one wants to delay. You can, you can so, build it into one. Sure. So that the council requests staff provide a response and have a reaction from various staff staff. Involving the community. Sure, we'll it's fine. It's, it's fine. Do. Don't worry. I don't, I don't want to delay it. I just want to be really clear that so we do get some community. Three, four, yep. needs some work done. Four's gone. Four's gone. gone. The, I, no, the, the one that you were saying about getting a register... Um, oh, with e um, so. right. just, just, yeah, okay. that's fine. So you can you can add two into one. Yeah, just by referencing the community. And just add um. Yeah, so yeah, I need so just add. Oh, so the times, roles, and outcomes of the various work streams dealing with the fight the wastewater treatment plant. Um, in conjunction with the local community or something. Yep, all right. So then we can lose two completely. Oh, and community boards. In conjunction with the local community and, and community boards. Yeah. And then when that comes back in two weeks, hopefully there's been a bit of a process around getting something. Yeah, and it doesn't need to be overly formalised, as was teased out in the earlier questions, it means we can get on Let's with get it. On it so now we lose two. So on this basis then... Celeste and Sarah, are you happy to incorporate one and two into your resolution? You are. All right. So can we now incorporate um, Yanni's paragraphs one and two into the main resolution? And then I think we've got something that's capable of being um, Andrew, debated. just can I, Andrew, can I just, um, just question the expectations for... Um, council staff working in conjunction with the community boards to prepare that plan. Um, I think there will be elements of that recovery plan that we will work with the community board on, but there's a lot of um, other operational or technical work that we probably don't need to work with the community board on, and I'm just a bit concerned that um, this might delay us finalising that plan and time to come back in two weeks. So the that sentiment of the discussion that was happening just a few minutes ago at this corner of the table was very much, and the spirit of Sarah's questions earlier, were very much, you know, let's involve the community, let's get the communications and the, the inputs right, and let's be talking to the right people and working in partnership, but let's not be doing that in a way that slows things down. Sorry, is it better to um, separate out the community engagement? I think it would okay, be so helpful if, we if a, it was. If we had a separate one under six, um, so a different seven, just um, that staff work closely with the community and community boards on on communication and well-being, yeah. and then you kind of know that would work well. Is that is that okay? 
if that's easier to implement, and you've heard the discussion. Yeah. 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 yeah well-being generally. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's right, social so economic. The staff work closely with the community and community boards on communications. Yeah, communications and well-being. Yeah, it would. On communications, yeah, well-being, well well and well -being environmental yeah. considerations. Yeah. But we also want them to be looking at the okay. communications early and stuff. We, we, we'll need to, we need to move this on. So, Celeste, Sarah, you're comfortable with the wording here? All right, great. Yep. Communication, well-being, and environment. Yep, okay. All right, so moved, seconded, happy with the wording. Is there any discussion on this? Yanni. Right. Um, well, we, we, we are where we are today, right? And, and you know, I, th I think today is finally an acknowledgement that there is a health and well-being issue of major concern and we're doing something about it. And, you know, it was interesting to go back through my old emails to see on the 2nd of November, I was putting requests in for what the well-being and the welfare response would be. And I've, as I've been approached by local residents on a regular basis in November 21, December 21, uh, March 2022, April 2022, it's become very apparent that this is what we need. We need a response and recovery action plan or program that clearly shows what, what we need to do because it's a way for the community to look and see that the things that are important are being addressed. The only thing that will give this community hope, given what's happened uh, in the last seven months, is not words, but action. And that action needs to be transparent, it needs to be monitored, and it needs to be accountable. And so that's why I've proposed that we have this sort of um, program that gets developed, because we've been through these things before as a city. We've been through the floods, we've been through the earthquakes, we've been through the fires, we've been through the terror attacks. This city has had huge experience in dealing with disaster, unfortunately, and there's a whole bunch of lessons that we've learned from those things that we now must apply to this. And, you know, although I'm disappointed this has taken so long, um, we are where we are today, and the most critical thing going forward is that we get these things in place as soon as possible to address the health and well-being of our local community and our environment. I just want to say that... Um, you know, what's really interesting to me on reflection is the, the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of money and resources we've been forced to spend on chlorinating our water supply for a risk, a perceived risk, contrasted to this where we have a very real issue in our community where we're struggling to get the resources and support and the funding. And it's just such an amazing contrast, really, isn't it? That that here we are being told by um, Ministry of Health that we have to do all this because of the risk to our water supply of, of chlorination, uh, et cetera. But when it comes to something like this, which is having a huge impact on our city and on our community, we've hardly heard anything from them around support, around uh, assistance, and around what we can do. And I appreciate that we're in the middle of a pandemic, but you know we need to continue to work collaboratively with central government, local government, and the community to get the best outcome possible for our residents to address the serious issues that they are raising. And today is a start to do that. But we, again, as I said, we'll be measured in our actions, not our words. And this document that I'm proposing will be uh, a way for the community to hold us to account. Is there any further discussion? Leanne. Um, Thanks very much. Look, I um, I want to um, pay tribute to uh, Councillor Yani Johansson, and I don't do this very often, um, but I am going to do it on this occasion. Uh, and the reason is is that um, Yani has raised uh, the need to reach out into this community with letterbox drops, drop-in sessions, and focus meetings, letting people know what was going on and responding to concerns as they arose. 
And it's not as if we don't know that's what you do after a disaster. It is simple stage one crisis management. It is communication, communication, communication. It is the be all and end all of how we get ourselves through really difficult and trying times. We did that during the earthquakes. Um, we did that through the floods and the fires. And as Yanni has reminded us, we know this stuff. And for some reason, we didn't get that right. And that's why I stood up in front of the community and apologised to them. And um, and it was a community meeting that I, well, I stood up in front of. And the reason I apologised was that if we had been out talking to them early, we would have been listening to them as well. And we would have been hearing the concerns. And the concerns are environmental and their personal health and well-being, and it's that stench that is just driving them to the end of their tether. And uh, I think that the, um, you know, Yanni took me out to, um, you know, sort of, well, we were going to have a street corner meeting, but it actually started to rain, so we had a, a garage meeting with some of the residents of Shortland Street. And, um, you know, one guy literally cleaned... Um, part of the bit under his eaves. So you could see the white against the this black sort of kind of sooty um, thing that was there. And it's so obvious. When you stand there with somebody who asks you a question you can't answer, you know that that's the answer that we need to be finding. Um, there are many, many more things. And I think what I like about the package that we have in front of us is that it's utterly and completely flexible. It can be um, built in to support other people who are doing work like the SVA, and I want to pay homage and tribute to them again, uh, coming to the aid of the people of the East. I remember standing at the end of my driveway after the earthquakes and seeing them pour down the street to help, and now they're back. So that was a legacy of the earthquakes. Let this be a legacy of lessons learned. Let us learn this lesson finally. When something happens, remember to look out. Look out into the community and make sure we respond to their needs. And that's what this package is about. Celeste. Um, I'll also acknowledge um, Yanni, who I, Councillor Yanni, who's um, also jo Johansson, sorry, uh, who's been working tirelessly on this issue. And um, also I want to acknowledge the work of staff have been working tirelessly um, because I know it's, it's there's been no easy solution and um, they're, yeah, they're doing a great job and it is a difficult situation. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge the real lived experience of residents um, and the impacts of the odor, offensive odours that are being felt by many. There's no question that the issues are real and we need to do better. Residents are tired from telling us that there's a problem. There's a lack of trust and one action now. This is completely fair and reasonable. We need to do better to protect the health and well-being of re residents. The research shows that even low levels of smell can impact people, even when that event itself may not be offensive and objectable. Sensitisation occurs when um, people experience things differently, so it can affect somebody differently in a, one neighbourhood to another. So um, we know that these impacts don't end at a council defined boundary, but today that's what we're looking at and we have to start somewhere. So I'm pleased to see that we're looking at other options. I think we need to keep the support practical, easy to access and make it available to those that need it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against, that's carried. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that, it's fair to say, has taken a little longer than we perhaps anticipated it would, but the questions and the answers and the detail in both, um, I think, really underline the purpose and the benefits of these um, two weekly updates. Um, and once again, I'm appreciative of the level of engagement that we've seen from the community, from the people sitting around this table and from our staff in making sure that it was such a good discussion. So thank you very much indeed for that. Now, what that has done is meant that our, our anticipated timing for the meetings have changed somewhat. We committed to a lunch break between one and two, and we do need a lunch break. 
Um, that means that now when we come back, the first thing that we'll do will be the organics processing plant paper, and then we'll move into the remaining papers of the meeting. So um, apologies particularly to um, members